with that, let's begin. Um, and I'd like to do a little tune in. And since we're talking about really um, the abuse in the yoga world caused by gurus, I think one of the most important things for us to do is to awaken our own inner guru. So with that, I'd like to just take about a five minute check-in, internal check-in, and do this practice with you that was taught by my teacher in awakening our own inner guru. And it's a very simple practice. So I'd just like you to just sit there for a moment, wherever you are, just close your eyes. And begin to breathe in and out through your nose. If it's within your capacity where you're sitting or how you're sitting, see if you can just lengthen the spine for a moment to feel that inner channel enlivening and awakening and elongating. Begin to watch the breath at the nostrils and see the breath moving through the entrance of the nostrils to a point up between the eyebrows and then just above that point. So it's as if you're imagining the breath moving up an inverted V. So moving through the entrance of the nostrils up this inverted V to that point just above the center between your eyebrows. Just imagine that that breath that you're breathing in that's moving up through your nostrils embodies all your love, all your compassion, all your devotion. And it's moving up to that center, which we often refer to as the Guru Chakra, also known as Agna Chakra. And there sits between that point, or at that place, a flame. So if you can just imagine that as the breath is moving up, it's moving towards the center of the forehead. And there's a flame that sits there. And as you're breathing in and breathing out, that all your love and devotion is moving towards that point. And where that flame sits, this flame that represents the tradition of yoga, that represents all of the sages and the teachers who have embodied this tradition. That flame that represents all aspects of creation, all aspects of the sustainer and the healer. That represents that aspect that helps us to transition and move on and or transform. Offer your love and devotion to this flame, to this guiding force. And bring your hands to a namaste and bring the heel of your hand to that place at the third eye.
and to offer our love and devotion to those three different teachers, Om Guru Brahma, Om Guru Vishnu, Om Guru Shiva, Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Namaste. So this is a fantastic little practice my teacher taught me to just be able to tune into that inner wisdom and that inner light. And one of the reasons why I'm doing this podcast series and have been doing these series of webinars is not only to start a conversation, a much, I think, needed conversation, but also to awaken that inner power of discrimination. One of the interesting things I often find is how many things just kind of roll off of our tongues and we don't ever really stop to think about it too much. Even though that inner discriminator is going, this doesn't quite sound right. We just start to say whatever we're going to say or repeat uh, what other people re say uh, without ever really stopping to kind of process it. And so part of my own personal journey in writing Stop Stretching and also producing the podcast series and in doing these webinars has been to just kind of pause and go, does this really make sense? <laughs> I don't remember which episode it was. I think it was episode four. I was talking about opening the hips, for example. And we never really talk about opening the hips, which is something we're going to circle back to uh, very shortly. But does it really make sense that we want our hips open? Hmm. That's something to think about. Let's put a pin in it. <laughs> So having said that, I'd like to introduce you to Amy, who I'm going to now pin with me. And this is Amy here. And Amy is everything to me in my life. <laughs> she came to Blue Osa about a year ago. And this was before I had started doing any writing uh, with Stop Stretching or even thinking about a podcast. And then Amy came onto the scene and then changed everything in my life. Um, and she started off as a volunteer and now she works as, um, helps me as my assistant, my lovely, beautiful assistant, mind you. Um, and I've invited her in here and Amy um, will tell you a little bit more about herself in just a moment, but she is a yoga teacher. She's been a yoga leader and, um, and a creator. She's organized, uh, um, these yoga festivals where she lives and she is an action oriented person and she's also an agent of change. So Amy, just take a quick uh, moment to introduce yourself and let's get this conversation rocking. Amy, I can't hear you. <laughs> you are on mute. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, and that wasn't my I computer. <laughs> Um, welcome everybody. It's great to be here with all of you and great to be here with, with Aaron. As he said, I'm kind of working behind the scenes with him and I had the fortune of staying at Blue Osa last year for five months, which was amazing. So I got a lot of like inside experiences with Aaron and it's really been a joy working with him, but also just learning about Ayama and applied yoga anatomy, muscle activation and his kind of methodology and philosophy on all of this. And so I have been teaching yoga for over 20 years, so I've got a lot of experience kind of in my back pocket too. And so working with Aaron was a paradigm, is a paradigm shift. <laughs> and I'm excited for this conversation tonight because I'm ready for it. It's needed. It's, I should say it's needed in the yoga world. So, um, one of the things that we were going to start the conversation off with, Amy? Yeah, so we're starting the conversation off with just the question of have, have any of us ever suffered any kind of abuse in yoga or any kind of, <laughs> have we ever been injured in yoga? Have we ever experienced any kind of interaction with our teachers that have been harming? And maybe you want to start off, Aaron, sharing an I, experience? I have a whole list of experiences I can share. <laughs> um, I remember one time I, um, well, first of all, I had a teacher lay on me and tore my hamstring in my left leg. 
Um, and then another time I walked in, it was actually uh, when I met my teacher, Jenny Capular, and started taking yoga classes at the Iyengar Institute. And I won't mention, it wasn't Jenny, it was another teacher. Um, I thought I was going to Jenny's class and ended up in this other teacher's class. And it was just right after I broke my leg. And so, you know, I'd gone to Jenny's class to try to start recuperating and start moving and dealing with it. And I ended up not in Jenny's class, but in somebody else's class. And she was this kind of tiny, demure woman. <laughs> and she came over, put her hands on her hips and said, what are you doing here? <laughs> I said, I mean, I was like completely mortified, defeated. I just didn't know what to say. <laughs> I mean, I had both of my crutches, you know, and I was just trying to get my yoga props and I knew what I needed. Um, and I just said, I just take Jenny's class and she helps me heal. And she said, fine, you can sit over there. <laughs> so what about you, Amy? Have you ever had any problems? Yeah, I mean, well, similarly, I had the same experience happen to me years ago where I was in a yoga class and the teacher, I was in a forward fold, the teacher adjusted me by laying over my back and I also had a hamstring tear, which took me years to heal and rebound from. Um, and I think in those situations, what's just interesting is, and we're going to get into this obviously, but just that dynamic of like, as a student, you're kind of in the submissive state or what feels like a submissive state. And so, and the woman who adjusted me was actually even a, a friend, she was a peer. And yet I still wasn't able to speak up and say, Ooh, 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 you know, you're going a little too far. And before you know it, you know, an injury can happen in a moment. And so coming back to myself and my own responsibility with that, um, which we're going to talk about, but yes. And there's probably been many other instances too, where it's just, something's off about the, di the dynamic that comes forth Yeah. as a, you know, being on my mat as a student. Absolutely. So, yeah. So maybe we can talk about that. Like what, what in that situation, what are teachers doing wrong or, you know, how can teachers improve to avoid these kind of situations happening? Well, <laughs> I think there's a lot of things that they can do. First of all, yoga teachers, stop touching your students. <laughs> just stop it. Stop it. You're just not trained to touch your students. I, I, I just... I'm appalled at like the willingness or the 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 um, assertiveness that yoga teachers feel in touching people, and I think it's really important. There's many, there's so many things that are important for people to remember, but one of them is that there is no history um, in the yoga tradition of student, sorry, of teachers touching their students. There just isn't. It didn't, there, there isn't. I, usually yoga teachers, quote unquote, uh, were br a, a Brahmin caste, which means that they were a very high caste and it would have been considered sinful for them to touch their students that would have taken on the karma of their students. So they always, there's this huge wall between the teacher and the students. Now I'm not advocating and saying that you know, I'm trying to put a wall up necessarily between me and my students, but I think it's just important to kind of note that. And we also didn't see, we didn't see adjustments happen until Patabi, you know, used to thrust his naked body and on people. That's when we started to see adjustments um, come into play. And I also think that adjustments really kind of took a life of their own in this sort of Western um, athletic model, if you will, of, of, you know, of, of people coming to fitness classes and then, you know, people coming over and, and I don't know, adjusting people, you know, if you're lifting weights or something, you know, do it like this. And that's not what yoga is about. Um, so I think it's really important for yoga teachers to just really stay in their lane. You know, yoga teachers, try to be so many things to so many people and that we really only have, we're only licensed, if you will, to do two, maybe three things. And the first thing is we're licensed, if you want to say licensed, to teach people how to breathe. Mm -hmm. And we're licensed to teach people how to move safely 
and we're licensed to maybe <laughs> this this last one is a little iffy but to teach some philosophy and by teaching philosophy i'm not talking about telling people how they should live but really how to how to guide their awareness inwards you know like i just did with the meditation that's a very philosophical meditation practice so we're not telling people how to live their life we're telling people you know how to experience yoga which is how to bring your awareness more inside yourself so that you can be completely at rest i think it's really important that we as teachers really know what lane we're driving and stick in it mm -hmm. yeah wow i have so many things i want to ask you based on what you just said but it might take a really long time but i just want to make comment on this aspect of adjusting students and this idea well a couple of things that came to mind as you were speaking one that the adjustments often are to take you deeper yeah or to help you perfect the pose to do the pose better yeah and both both of those things i think allude to a lot of what you talk about is this idea that if i if i can only get a little deeper into my poses if i can perfect this pose if i can do it perfectly then I will somehow I'll accomplish something as a yogi. I'll become more enlightened or I'll be a better person or I'll get rid of those demons that are, are bothering me. And so just as you were speaking about the whole adjustment thing, it is really curious to even question like, why do we adjust students? Like what is the actual aim? Mm. And of course, sometimes maybe we don't want the student to injure themselves. Um, but that piece of going deeper, which I know you preach a lot, like back off, if anything, mm -hmm. you don't need to go deeper. And in fact, you should be pulling out and activating and engaging versus going deeper and stretching. So I just wanted to comment on that, which I think is really interesting. And um, well, then, then it's like, how much deeper do you need to go to be happy or to translate that differently? How much flexibility do you need to have to be happy? And yeah. I would, I would actually, I could make a very good argument that more flexible people are less happy <laughs> because they're, they have less stability, literally. And so, you know, it's like how much, how far do you need to go in a pose to be happy? And then you get this thing about, well, you want to experience, you know, the fullness of the pose. What are you actually biomechanically experiencing? is really a deep sense of euphoria and euphoria is not spiritual euphoria is like you know you've got more um, um <laughs> endorphins kicking through your system that's a physical high which is great i mean i'm all for physical highs i'm not sure that pushing my body beyond its in range of motion is the best way to create endorphins you know but you know Pura Vida. <laughs> yeah. And also, um, just more food for thought, but what is the perfected pose? Like, where do we even get these images of the postures we've, we've seen? You know, like, what is, what would be an ideal image of a posture for all of these unique bodies that come to yoga? You know, where is the ideal state? Where is the perfected pose? And, um, and what you mentioned about the euphoria piece, I think also an element of what you're experiencing in the pose might be your pain yeah too yeah you know i mean you might be able to reach euphoria but on the way there you're likely gonna feel all your pain <laughs> <laughs> um, so okay i could keep going on and on just with that little bit of conversation but i know we've got a lot more to cover we've got a so, lot to cover <laughs> so this piece of yoga teacher staying in their lane teaching people how to breathe how to move maybe a little bit of philosophy hopefully they have the anatomy training so they can really teach people how to move safely and as hopefully well as they have the uh, yama teacher training <laughs> um, you know, that, that oftentimes can be lacking a lot of teacher trainings nowadays that the anatomy piece isn't really embodied and so people yeah. might you know say the words but they might not actually really comprehend what's going on in the body yeah yeah so, i think that i just want to quickly comment on that you know like i every i have i meet so many yoga teachers and they're like yeah i did this there was this great anatomy component oh really what did you learn i don't remember <laughs> <laughs> awesome yeah. <laughs> you know yeah. that was such an awesome anatomy can you tell me three muscles that you remember 
<laughs> no. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean, that's not a that's not a judgment. It's just a fact. And um, I think that what what we need to do is create more, as you you said it really perfectly, embodied um, anatomy. Yes. Yes. I remember from my own training, it was very much somebody standing up in front of the classroom with a whiteboard and just writing <laughs> down, like, you have a circulatory system, you have, you know, it was, it was yeah. very intellectual. It wasn't an embodied experience. So, so teachers, if they stay in their lane, do their thing, the students come to class, what, what can the, is there any dynamic that can happen between the teacher and the student? What do you think that should look like? Um, this is a very complicated um, question because, you know, I, with everything that's been happening in the Me Too world, there's been a lot of blaming on yoga teachers. Yoga teachers should be like this. Yoga teachers should be like that. But the problem that people forget is that yoga teachers are human beings and human beings are, you know, we screw up all the time. And, and also, we all have egos. And so we may come into a teaching um, with the purest of intentions. I, I believe that all of us have the purest of intentions. Nobody came into wanting to teach yoga to become a, a rock star, I think. Um, and a lot of people just fall into it, you know. Um, even, even people in small towns having a small town studio, you know, having a group of 10 people come to your class and just like throw a lot of, um, uh, uh, compliments to you is is going to do something to your ego where you go oh I'm no longer you know simple Aaron now I'm the yoga teacher <laughs> and and I don't think that by the way there's anything wrong with that per se but the problem becomes when you start to act on it and when you start to allow your students to feed you know, that part of yourself where you really think you are this important person. Um, and I think that we need to, as yoga teachers, there's a couple of things that need to happen, but yoga teachers need to become more aware of this dynamic. And I, I don't really want to tell yoga teachers what they should do, but what I can say from my own experience is I keep a huge wall up between my students and I. Um, my students and teacher training, um, when they come, there's this big wall, and <laughs> if you want to call it the Chinese wall, <laughs> it's big, and it's long, and I don't even allow them to hug me usually. Like, you know, I usually save the, save the hugs for, like, the last day, and I do that for a lot of reasons, but one is because I'm so aware that students often come with something within them that needs to be filled, and this is the part in yoga, I think that we need to talk about more is because all of us come to yoga looking for something within us needing to be filled. Let's just face it, most humans, if not all humans, need something to be filled within them. But this is where yoga is so unique is that yoga is actually teaching you how to fill that thing within you yourself. Nobody else can fill it. Nobody. And you have to fill it in. And so part of the reason is in keeping that wall is like you got to deal with your stuff student you've got to work on yourself i can't do the work for you i'm not going to whatever i'm going to say is not going to fill that you know space within you that needs to be filled you've got to do the work yourself and the moment that i cross that line and start to do that you know to to make them feel special um i'm actually taking something away from them yeah, I love that. That was really well said. So if you were going to, I mean, and you kind of shared this through your own experience, but what would be like the top three things that a teacher should do? Just a teacher should do, and then how about the top three things that a student should do, which you already probably spoke to, but can you like <laughs> summarize it? Just like in terms of, okay, so we're in this dynamic we know there's like a power dynamic. There's been issues of abuse. Yeah. Um, in summary, uh, if you're a yoga teacher, have a wall up, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. Yeah, absolutely. Stay okay. in your lane. 
Um, and it, what I mean by wall is just understand like the students are on their own journey. And, you know, when like, you know, sometimes you'll get students hanging out like I don't have a studio anymore, but sometimes I would have students linger for a long time and want to pick my brain. And I would be like, you know, it, 15 minutes past the class, I I need to go. I can't stay here all night. And, you know, I'm not your therapist. I'm not your best friend. I'm your yoga teacher. So I'm happy to answer like one little question. Um, but if you want to book a private with me here, if I'm not doing privates here, you should book a private with this person. And I think like that's really important is for yoga teachers to recognize like, hey, stay in your lane. If your students is needing a therapist, refer them to a therapist. If they're needing a massage therapist, refer them, you know, like have a list of people that you can refer them to. I also think, too, it's really important to have clear boundaries. Like when I'm leading trainings, I have very clear boundaries on my expectations. And, you know, and there's like a there's a signed agreement. There's a verbal agreement. <laughs> it's like, you know, we unpack it. And I think that's also really helpful for people to know what are the policies? What are the boundaries of this relationship? Mm -hmm. I love that. OK, and that's kind of the wall, basically. But it's like maybe as teachers, we really need to sit down and think about like what is going to be my boundary with my students. Yeah, absolutely. And would there ever be a time where the boundary, I mean, can the boundary change? I mean, what if you, what if a student, what if you want to be friends with a student? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> I, think, I think that's an honest thing that might occur because a lot of people end up, their yoga students or, you know, yoga teachers community, it becomes a community kind of experience. Sure. Can there be crossover, do you think? I think, well, I think that there can be once the student is no longer my student per se. So with my teacher trainings, like there's the teacher training, then there's a three month process after the teacher training. So somewhere between, I would say six months to a year or two years afterwards, um, mm -hmm. sometimes I start to get to know people, but eh, once in a while, like there's a person here that's a couple of people here that have joined in that have been my students. And I would say that um, there's a bit more familiarity and a friendship now that's built, but I wouldn't also say that they're my students and we're not hanging out all the time. Um, so I think it's, I think that's one thing. I also think too, you know, my teacher, Alan, um, Alan Finger, he married one of his students, Sarah, um, uh, Sarah, his wife, Sarah. And I had a conversation with Alan about this. And one of the things that Alan said, which really struck me, was that he wasn't trying to hide anything. You know, it was like, it was like Sarah came on this retreat with him. They started hanging out. They started developing a friendship. And then over, you know, a lot of months, they started to get involved and then got married. And I think their child now is like 10 years old. And it's a beautiful family. And, and you know, a lot of people can have a lot of opinions about that. But one of the things I really respected about Alan was everything was out in the open. You know, and we what we've seen time and time and time again is that teachers often will tell students how they should be <laughs> and then behind closed doors do the complete opposite. Um, and, and that happens a lot in, in the yoga world. It happens a lot in any world, really. It's not just yoga teachers. So I think it's really important for people to be as transparent as possible. And, and with my students, I, I think that they would agree that I'm pretty transparent. <laughs> you know, I brag about the fact that I love wine. I do not try and hide it. <laughs> awesome. You, you are a human. You get to drink wine if you want. I can totally get it. Um, so on the student side, like, can we talk a little bit about, like, on the student side and the student's responsibility, like, what... What part do students play? Like, what do they have to come, what do they have to show up with to engage in a healthy relationship with their yoga teachers? I have gotten into so many arguments with yoga teachers about this um, because I, they always want to blame yoga teachers. Yoga teachers need to be better. Yoga teachers need to be do, doing this. And I'm like, yoga teachers don't know how. You know, they go in and they do a 200 hour yoga teacher training. And all of a sudden they're being called guru for God's sakes. That's ridiculous. 
Um, so I think that where I'm on the bandwagon about is twofold. I want to try to help yoga teachers start thinking about what they're doing and doing things differently. But I also want to really educate students on, on how to be better students. And I, it's, I think it's multi-tiered. Um, but one of them is, you know, first of all, let's be respectful to our teachers. And, and I think like part of the problem has come in the yoga world, especially these days from what I've seen is like so many yoga students are just assholes. They go to their yoga class and they're rating their teacher. This, they, I'm giving my teacher a one star because they didn't play good music. I mean, are you kidding me? really like this is the level of respect we're offering our yoga teachers um by the way the yoga teacher shouldn't have been playing music period but that's another story um <laughs> or the yoga teacher taught too fast they taught too slow they you know they the lights were too bright the lights were too i mean the list goes on and um i remember when i first came to new york and this teacher was like yelling or this, sorry, not this teacher, this um, student was yelling at the, stu the studio owner because the teacher had the audacity to chant OM in their yoga class. And so I think that, I think first and foremost, there needs to be a respect to our teachers. And that teacher, whoever they are, is holding some of the light of the tradition. How much of the light is, that's another conversation, but they're holding some of the light, like that needs to be respected and honored um, to, you know, some degree, because I'm I'm bringing that into myself. So let's let's honor our teachers. Let's give them respect, and let's also with ourselves hold that wall up. Like understanding we don't need anything from our teachers. That they're guiding us so that to teach us how we can start to fill that space within ourselves. Mm -hmm. Just offering the practices, right? Absolutely. How to, read, how to move, and here's a little nugget of philosophy to bring it all together. That's what it's and, all about. <laughs> yeah, and taking it in and embodying it and doing your work. Um, what I'm really hearing you say in all of that is just kind of we're all powerful beings. Yes. And we're all equal beings. And yes, we enter situations where the teacher might you know, appear to hold more power in that moment because they're presenting, they're guiding, um, but ultimately we're all powerful and we all have to take responsibility for ourselves and how we act and and to have some some discernment around our expectations and and that the people we're interacting with are humans and they're yes. going to make mistakes and they're going to be amazing also and all of those things. Well, and also too, I mean, it's there's an agreement between a student and a teacher and and as a student i think that you know we as students have to decide like do i really want this person as my teacher does this if you don't then don't go to them you know it's that simple there's the door um i but there's an inherent agreement and i think like when i'm leading a teacher training specifically because that's mostly my lane but even when i'm leading a class like if i if I'm traveling around the world and I walk into a class, there's an agreement, a silent agreement, but it's an agreement. It's like, I'm the teacher, you're the student. You're the student who wants to learn and I'm the teacher be here to teach you. And so there's that agreement. And, and I think that those roles need to be honored and respected. The moment I leave the classroom and walk out the class, now I'm just, I'm back to Aaron again, <laughs> you know? So I'm also very conscious, like, hey, this is, the moment I walk in, this is the, this is the hat, this is the ego, this is, you know, and I have a wealth of knowledge and I'm happy to share it, you know, and, and I'm, I own that, I, if you want to call it power, if you want to call it stand, if you want to call it place, but I own that. And, and I expect respect from students, you know, if you don't want to be here, leave, like no one's holding, holding you hostage. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's their responsibility to decide if they want to stay or not. And, and from a student's perspective, what would be like, you know, cause 
a, a brand new student coming to a yoga class, there's lots of yoga studios, there's lots of yoga teachers out there today. There's all different types of trainings that these teachers receive. Some of them have been doing it for a long time, some of them for like a week, you know. So as a student, are there certain things that they should look for? Is there any way that they can like feel out, like what, what, what do they look for in a yoga teacher? What do you suggest? Oh my God. So, um, I mean, it's hard. I, I wrote an article on, on how to find a guru and it's, it's hard. It's like, you know, are we looking for a yoga instructor? So a yoga instructor is someone who knows how to teach poses. Boom. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you yeah. can almost go anywhere and find a yoga instructor. Now, are they good? That's, you know, debatable. Um, and, and the problem is that most people are not discerning and understanding like what methodology of yoga um, might be better than others. Like I was talking to a person the other day who said, oh yeah, I just come up with sequences by getting on my mat and moving my body. And I was like, in the back of my mind, I was like, there's no intelligence in that. I, I didn't say that to them. Um, but I was just like, oh my God, the poor students that you have to, you know, are pleasure to get to teach with you. I mean, it's like you're basically getting a yoga class that's based upon what you just felt in the moment. There's no thought or rhythm or methodology is a good word to use. There's no methodology behind it. You want to be have a yoga teacher that's structured. I would say that one of the first warning signs is if you go to a class, your teacher's light. If you go to a class and the teacher goes, I don't really have a plan today. What do you guys want to learn? <laughs> I would actually bolt for the door at that moment. You know, um, I, you want a teacher that has structure, that has confidence, that that teaches with a sense of like, yeah, I know what I'm doing. So those are those are a couple of things that I would definitely look for. Okay. <laughs> but I would also say I would also say too like I would avoid teachers that are demonstrating a lot and mm -hmm. I would I would avoid teachers that are like teaching from the front of the room and that are not walking around you want to see that your teacher is walking around the room you want to see that your teacher is looking at you and paying attention to what is going on in the room I have heard so many teachers, um, yoga teachers say to me, especially when I first started uh, teaching, like, oh yeah, I'm, I haven't done my practice yet, but I'm about to go teach my class where I'll fit my practice in. And it's like, that is not really going to do anything, you know, for you especially, but also for your students. Like you're kind of like taking away from your students. But the other thing too is like when I'm demonstrating and, and, you know, I'm, what I'm about to say kind of gets into a gray area because now everything is online. So let's just like keep in the lane of live classes for now. OK, but but if you're going to a class where the teacher is just leading postures from the front of the room, that's not useful and that's not yoga. Um, it also sets up this kind of feedback loop in the students where they're going, oh, that's what I should look like and and so that's also creating like a negative feedback loop that's not going to be useful to the student we want to be able as teachers we want to be able to guide people to be able to experience their body in a way where their attention is inward if i'm looking at a teacher if i'm listening to music my attention is not going inward it's going outward and it's finding something outward to fill something within me so that's not, and that's not yoga. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think I love that, that point. I just want to emphasize that, that piece of like, that's part of teaching yoga is to help your student turn their attention inward. So what actions are you taking to really facilitate that? And, and there is a time and place to demonstrate a pose, like if it's a new pose or, you know, you're teaching the, the anatomical way to get into the pose, but staying up in front of class demonstrating or having a lot of distractions like loud music might not be the ideal way to bring the person in. <laughs> well, and I often will get, Amy, like, 
how do I say this? Like I'll usually pick out, if I want to demonstrate a pose, I'll usually pick out the least, I'm going to use this word and I hate using this word, you know that, but I will usually pick the least, let's use the, a different word, the least mobile person in the class. <laughs> You know what? I was trying to avoid the F word. Um, <laughs> but, but I, you know, the least mobile or the least aware person that I judge in that moment or the person that I see that's struggling the most because they're kind of like setting a bar that, hey, it doesn't matter what the pose looks like. It matters, A, that you're activating, B, that you're stable and see most importantly that you're actually feeling something in your body like your 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 mm -hmm. attention is able to go inwards mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. i love that so on that activation note um that you are activating and since this, you're you know the the teacher of ayama <laughs> teachers are so more on this like the teacher side of things if teachers are instructing their classes and one of the common things that, that comes out a lot is like, open your hips, go deeper. And I know that we wanted to touch on that a little bit. Um, <laughs> my partner comes to yoga with me a lot and I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, so we don't have access to an Ayama class unless I'm doing it online with Aaron. But my partner recently came to class and they were doing pigeon at the end of the class and I did some like muscle activation mm -hmm. and Shay was like, yeah, my partner. Yeah, it's kind of weird. Like, why do I want to open up my hips? I, I kind of want my hips to actually be like tight so they hold my, my leg bone in place and I can like stand and walk and do all these things. And and he's he's not super experienced with yoga, but he has done one class with Aaron before. So along that line, in terms of like opening your hips or some other statements that teachers say a lot, how can we start to reframe that as a, for me, even as a teacher, how can I start to, what's an easy way to start reframing that and instructing postures differently along the Ayama, with, with the Ayama principles? So, um, I mean, definitely yoga teachers, again, this is like rethinking sort of what is coming out of our mouth and asking ourselves, like, why do we need to open the hips? Mm-hmm. I, I think it's really important to for people to ask like why why do I need my hips open? And I was I've been watching doing as you know a deep dive into a lot of um, videos online, um, and just seeing what other people are doing and what other people are talking about. But I'm constantly amazed at how many people, both yoga and fitness oriented, are like oh yes, and we need to open the hips. And they never really say why they need to open their hips. And there was this one teacher that said, so you can come down and do a squat. Well, why do I need to do a squat? Why is that important for me to come down and be able to squat? Like, I, you know, that's not in my normal biomechanical movement. I'm not a gardener, you know, who needs to sit and squat all the time. So why do I need to squat? And maybe I can come onto my knees. I don't know why I need to squat. So this whole idea of, you know, there's function um, uh, versus flexibility, you know, um, function versus movement. And we need to kind of like think about, you know, how functional is what we're doing? Um, what is the function behind doing what we're doing? And that's what I try to work on with people is like with, with triangle pose, there's such an emphasis on opening up the side of the body. Why? Why do we need to open up the side of the body? Well, great, you can get the other hand down to the ground, but you know, if you ask that person to come out of the pose, they have to bend their knee, they have to put their hands on their waist, they have to kind of bend forward and try and like roll themselves up because they have no muscular engagement going on. The force output of the muscles has been depleted. So really, instead of coming into triangle pose with that idea of like, yeah, I need to open my side, maybe what I really need to do is start working on engaging the side body. So in sort of, I don't know if I answered the question, but in terms of like opening the hips, I just think it's like flip the script. Let's engage the hips. <laughs> Let's pull the yeah. hips inward. Yeah, and so that would be maybe a way that, like myself, even as a teacher, if I'm teaching, like when I am guiding students into postures, thinking more about what what am 
what are they engaging? What do they need to engage? Yeah. Because it does kind of weave into like, if you're instructing your students to like open their hips and then they walk out the door and they have an injury because they're destabilized in their mm -hmm. joints, um, especially if you're already somebody who's fairly flexible, you, that's, that's a little, that could be like abuse in a way, you know, you're giving instructions that are, are harmful to yeah. your students. So, yeah. Um, I mean, yeah, so there's a lot to unpack there. I mean, so with the, what yoga teachers usually end class with is just like some of the worst poses that leaves people so unstable. And, and we see an epidemic with yoga people, like so many yoga people have back pain, have neck pain, have herniated discs, have shoulders that are in pain. Like every yoga teacher training that I lead, there's usually 80% of the people in the room have some sort of yoga related injury, which I usually refrain, reframe as ego related injuries, but they usually will have some injury related to yoga that they're doing. But yet what's astonishing is that they're still into it. I mean, they flow into Costa Rica to do this training because they think that intuitively they know that there's something beneath the surface. And that's what we need to start teaching people. What is beneath the surface? Mm, yes. I love it. All right. Um, I know we're getting close to the end of our hour. <laughs> and we need to leave so, some room for some FAQs too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, some questions and maybe we can just go over I know there's some takeaways that we want to make sure the list or the, the viewers listeners um, here can we go over some of those takeaways or? yeah these takeaways are are really more for like students it's not really so much for teachers because I you know the, teachers that's a whole other conversation which we've I think we've kind of given a lot of good tips but for students who don't have access to a yama um, I really wanted to try and give some tips uh, to you guys so that you guys can at least take something tangible uh, with you. Mm -hmm. So I think first and foremost, um, let's join the resistance and <laughs> stop doing child's pose. Anytime your teacher says, let's go into child's pose, go, no, no, no. I respect you, but I respect <laughs> my body more. No more child's pose. It is the worst yoga pose um, out there. I, I mean, we could get into all of the reasons why you need to listen to episode number three, two. Oh God, now I forget. Um, anyways, it's in there. It's in the stop stretching series, but listen to them. Um, cause I go into great detail about why. And then the second one is tell, I think this is a really important one. As you heard Amy and I talk about right at the beginning, we both have been injured by adjustments. Tell your teacher, you do not want to be physically adjusted anymore. If they want to give you verbal cues, that's great. You know, draw your hips into the midline, lift your chest, et cetera, et cetera. But m yoga teachers do not know how to touch people. They just don't. They're not trained physical therapists. They haven't had any training in muscular um, uh, movement or muscle function. Um, and probably they don't even know where the muscles are or what the muscles are that they're touching in the first place. So just tell your teacher you do not want to be physically touched at all. <laughs> um, and then I think the third thing is to educate yourself as much as you can on your body and get the book, Stop Stretching, because in here I have a lot of stuff on anatomy in here that will start teaching you little by little about your body and what's going on inside your body and how to start treating yourself, how to start fixing yourself. Um, and then of course, most importantly, stop stretching. <laughs> and the fourth thing is, um, if you want, if you asked earlier, like, how do you find a good teacher? You know, if you're, if you want to have some fun, test your teacher's knowledge. Um, say, ask them like, what are three muscles in your back? Like you keep telling me to stretch my back muscles. What are the muscles that we're supposed to be stretching? <laughs> List three. They probably won't even be able to come up with one. So, or, or another fun one is like, you know, they keep telling you to open your hips. What are three muscles in the hips that I should be opening? <laughs> so, uh, you know, test your teacher's knowledge. And, and then the fifth one is, you know, this is kind of like a little 
self-promotional plug, but have people listen to Stop Stretching. Um, it's really a great series. It's very educational. More importantly, it's science-based, it's fact-based, and it will start to educate um, people out there, especially other yoga teachers possibly, at the very least starting to shift their mind into a new possible paradigm. And I really, we really need to start flipping the script on so many things in the yoga world. Definitely opening your hips is at the top of the list. So awesome. I, I want to just kind of open it up, um, Amy, to just any questions. Like, does anybody have any questions um, that they want to ask? It can be about this topic. It can be a, anything about a yama. Um, it can be really anything yoga. This one of the reasons why I do these um, Q and A's almost monthly is to just provide an opportunity for people to ask questions that they've been having about yoga. I have a question, Erin. Yes, Lisa. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Um, so I know because I've done your, your yoga teacher training, um, I know that you teach, give students what they want so that you can give them what they need. So a lot of students, and I used to want a lot of child's pose, and used to want loud music, and I really changed my practice, but as I think about teaching students who you know, might be coming from a busy work day because they're, they thought they were going to get to rest in child's pose for a while, or they thought they were going to get to like bliss out to some music. What's the best kind of method to ease people into understanding this healthier way of practicing yoga or this, you know, more present way of practicing yoga and helping them understand this is actually what they need? Well, I mean, there's definitely an argument to be made about meeting people where they are and curving them towards where we're going. So what I kind of hear is that people are coming and they're feeling very dynamic. You know, they're, you know, using kind of yoga jargon. They're very vata deranged, sometimes pitta deranged. So they're very fiery. Their, you know, attention is everywhere. And so what you've got to do is meet them in that dynamic state, maybe start a class that's a little bit more dynamic and then start to arc it. Is that the right word? Arc means going up. So moving down <laughs> into more of, a, of an introspective class. Um, that's, that's my suggestion. Like, you know, people would come in my studio. I would always play music when people were coming in, usually have some kind of, you know, upbeat mantras playing, um, kind of create a bit of a festive atmosphere. And so right away, there's kind of like this energetic component when people are coming in um, and then start to change and shift the energy slowly. And you know that how much I love to play with energy. And, and you know, a lot of teachers, I'm going to kind of make a little bit of a judgment and I don't want to sound like an asshole. In this, but, so take it for what it's worth. But a lot of teachers play music because they don't have a big enough, they don't have a big enough energy field to fill the space. And that's what I would invite teachers to start considering is like amplify yourself. You don't need a backup of music to fill the space. You are the space and you are the container that's going to hold that space. So it's really kind of like the yoga teacher ne needs to get comfortable in their own skin. And when I reflect, you know, I used to play music all the time in my classes. And I remember Rod in my first teacher training saying, you know, you guys, I'm going to expect you guys never to play music again after a while. And so I had to start weaning myself off of music. And what I started to notice was in those moments of silence, I was the one that was uncomfortable. My students weren't uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. <laughs> So I think that sometimes yoga teachers need to really kind of look at themselves and address those, their, those two things, like be comfortable with silence, be comfortable with stillness, and then also know how to fill a space. Did that, did that help, Lisa? Okay. <laughs> Amy, do you want to add anything? I thought that, I know, I think that's great. The piece of like, who's, who's, uncomfortable with that silence. I think that's a really good question. And I also think that, um, 
you know, as yoga, a lot of yoga teachers want to help, they want to please their students, they want to give them a good experience, and, but really owning, I'm teaching, this is what I'm teaching, I'm guiding them on this yoga journey, versus I'm pleasing my students to get them to, to like my class, or to like me too, like kind of just checking ourselves around that, because there can be that people-pleasing desire in us as well. Yeah. And also, I think, one other thing on that, is to tell your students, hey, this might be a different experience for you. I'm not gonna play music and we're not gonna practice child's pose because of this reason. Mm, yeah. You might be really used to it, but we're not we're I'm I'm weaning weaning us weaning myself, weaning us from this practice and we're gonna do this instead. So I yeah. think transparency too and just speaking really clearly about it and letting them know, giving them a heads up be helpful too yeah and i also think too like there's nothing wrong with starting a class in shavasana you know mm -hmm. if you if you want to do that you know how many times i've done that lisa um but i've also started classes standing up you know and just you know we've just chanted om standing up and then start a practice there and then go into our ayama preparational practices and then our you know our standing poses etc cetera, etc cetera. So I don't think that there's anything wrong with having people stand up, like just, okay, everybody, let's stand up. Inhale, bring the arms up. Exhale, let's bring the arms down and chant Om three times, you know, something like that. So I think we can be very creative in, in the way that we meet people. Mm -hmm. um, anybody else have any other questions? So I have a question. Um, what about Supta Virasana? Supta Virasana. So for people who don't know what Supta Virasana is, it's sometimes it's called hero's pose and it's reclined hero's pose. What's your question about? So because of bending forward. It's what? Sorry? Saying because of the bending forward and because of the fact that you're telling us not to the child's pose. Mm-hmm. Well, Supta Virasana is, is that deep um, thigh stretch. It's when you're reclined in, in, in sitting in between your feet and then lying backwards, right? Is that the pose yes. you're referring to? Yes, yes, yes. Um, so I, I'm going to myself, you know, because you know how flexible I am or not. Um, I realize I've done obviously a lot of damage to myself in the process that I'm working with regarding some of the yamas that you're doing here and um, I'm, I'm trying to put it in, in my brain about what have I what have I done with my muscles to stretch them to the point where they're that slinky you keep, I love that picture by the way where it's totally <laughs> slinked out I mean it's no longer I feel like that with myself okay yeah. So. So see, so to, before I answer that question, I mean, part of as a, as from an ayama perspective, what I would suggest is staying away from any kind of passive poses. So any kind of postures that start to passively stretch muscles, and Supta Virasana is one of the biggest. Um, poses like there's literally no muscular engagement in that pose it's all completely passive you're forcing the hamstrings to contract uh, way beyond their capacity of contraction which then is going to lead to knee joint instability you're also forcing the thighs to overstretch um, and you know and then you're also forcing the um, um, to some degree, the psoas muscle to over elongate um, somewhat. So there's just, it's a lot of instability that starts to get created in the hip joints and knee joints um, by that particular pose. It's not, I, let's just say that I will never teach that pose again. <laughs> I sort of thought you would say that, you know, and I'm really good at doing that one. <laughs> of course you are. <laughs> I mean, flexible people love some of these poses because they can just go into them and quote unquote, let go. And, and so anytime we start to passively do poses, I don't know that overstretching is a word that I would use. Um, but 
but definitely when you are are consistently doing postures where you're shutting down muscles, it really creates an effect where that muscle just has been repeatedly shut down. But more to the point, other muscles have started to overcompensate to create stability both in the, the, the knees and the hips and muscles that should not be doing the job. So you think about how big the hamstrings are. You think about how big the thighs are. You need those muscles to maintain stability of those joints. You know, you don't want to be relying on the plantaris to work on doing knee uh, flexion, for example. You don't want to be relying on little muscles um, uh, around the knees for knee extension. So you need those big muscles to be doing their jobs. And you see that a lot with people. They go into these poses and then they try to stand back up. And they're kind of like having to put one hand on the floor and the other hand roll over onto their knees and go, oh my God, as they try to stand up. Why are they doing that? Because they have no force output in the muscles to support the integrity of the joints and to be able to support the trunk and spine. So now they're relying on their hands and, you know, and basically just kind of crawling back upwards. That's not a good thing, and that's not how we want students to be. <laughs> Aaron, you know what? I just said 50, 50, almost fifty-five years of yoga has gone out the window for me. No, we just or we're just kind of retuning and refining the script. That's all. I don't feel like that right now. <laughs> Well, we're going to call it night at 6.04, so we went a little bit over. Um, but I hope this conversation was valuable for everybody. <laughs> Amy, I want to thank you so much for joining me in this conversation. Yes, thanks, thanks for having me. It was fun to collaborate around it. <laughs> bringing, you know, bringing your goddess perspective. I really appreciate it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, have a super wonderful week. Um, I hope this was useful. And please, whatever you do, stop stretching. <laughs> <laughs> Namaste, everybody. Be well. Okay. Bye. <laughs>